Zach Wood is sitting at his computer courting controversy. It's the winter of 2016, and Wood is a sophomore at Williams College, the prestigious liberal arts school tucked away in the sleepy northwest corner of Massachusetts. He's also the president of Uncomfortable Learning, a student group that brings incendiary speakers to campus, staunch anti-feminists, climate change deniers. And now, Wood hits send on an all-school bulletin. Uncomfortable Learning has selected its next speaker, John Derbyshire. Derbyshire is a writer and mathematician. He's also a self-proclaimed racist who believes that black people, and these are quotes, are less intelligent and ferociously hostile. There are generalized statistical differences between races, and those are facts about the world that we can discover empirically and evaluate and maybe feed into our social policy. Wood's announcement booms across the campus like a cannon shot, and the backlash is swift. First, his friends bombard him with exasperated text messages. They can't understand why someone like Zach, a young black liberal Democrat, would want to give a platform to somebody like Derbyshire. Then strangers start replying to the post, and the conversation takes a menacing turn. Things like, Zach Wood may look black, but as far as I'm concerned, he's white. And we need the oil and switch to deal with him in this midnight hour. Later, someone slips a small piece of paper under Wood's dorm room door. It's a death threat. Wood's friends urge him to give in, but he doesn't. Instead, he spends two hours trying to convince a group of black campus activists that Derbyshire's appearance is an opportunity. He says there's nothing to be gained by avoiding controversy or censoring ideas, no matter how obnoxious or defective you think they are. The only way to bring about real change, he argues, is to hear people out. But the other students don't see it that way. One tells him, you may be an intellectual looking for a good debate, but this isn't an argument to me. This is personal. Wood argues that it's better for a conversation to be difficult than one-sided, but nobody else sees it that way. Eventually, the college president calls Wood to say he agrees with the majority and that he's canceling the event. In response, Wood pounds out an article for the campus newspaper that explains his motives. He thinks the world would be a better place if we all challenged our convictions, whatever they may be. He calls the college president's intervention, quote, undemocratic, irresponsible, and frankly, pathetic. The Associated Press picks up the story, and then the Washington Post. Now, with the spotlight trained on him, what does he do? He invites another polarizing speaker to campus, Charles Murray, author of The Bell Curve, a book that makes arguments connecting intelligence to race. And the backlash starts again. At this point, you may be asking yourself, is it worth it? Is there really that much to gain from discomfort? Zachary Wood says yes. And now he's written a book about how to bring open-mindedness to our most difficult interactions. Hi, I'm Kwame Christian, CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I have a quick question for you. When was the last time you had a difficult conversation? These conversations happen all the time, and that's exactly why you should listen to Negotiate Anything, the number one negotiation podcast in the world. We produce episodes every single day to help you lead, persuade, and resolve conflicts both at work and at home. So level up your negotiation skills by making Negotiate Anything part of your daily routine. From Wondery, I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. I founded The Next Big Idea Club, along with four of our generation's biggest thinkers, Malcolm Gladwell, Susan Cain, Daniel Pink, and Adam Grant, to connect people to some of the boldest ideas that are shaping our culture and our future. Each week on the podcast, we bring you one idea with the power to change the way you see the world. This week, the value of difficult conversations. Zach Wood is one of the nation's leading commentators on issues of free speech, despite the fact that he only graduated from college in 2018. He served as a columnist and editor at The Guardian and as an assistant curator at TED. 
In his new memoir, Uncensored, he makes a bold, forceful argument for engaging with ideas that we find disturbing, hurtful, or even dangerous. Wood spent his early years in Detroit, living with an abusive, schizophrenic mother. After an intervention by Child Protective Services, he moved to Washington, D.C. to live with his father in a small, tumble-down duplex in one of the city's poorest neighborhoods. A voracious reader and an excellent student, he got scholarships to attend a series of Tony private schools, the kind of schools where kids use the word summer as a verb. Much of his book focuses on what it was like to spend his youth crossing boundaries, rich and poor, black and white, comfortably elite, and fervently aspirational. Wood recently met up with Next Big Idea Club curator Susan Cain, author of the book Quiet, which changed the conversation about what it means to be an introvert. Together, they talk about the art of persuasion, the need for tolerance, and the power of radical openness. Zach, I have to tell you, it is so exciting for me to be here with you today and such an honor because I absolutely loved your book. It's such a compelling and poignant memoir on the one hand, and then on the other hand, it's grappling with some of the most intellectually difficult issues of our time. And so thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much. It's so great to be with you. So, Zach, in your book, you talk about having been the president, while you were at Williams College, of a campus club called Uncomfortable Conversations. And in that role, you were inviting provocative speakers to campus, including white supremacists. And you said in your book, I invite white supremacy apologists to campus. Here's why. Can you talk about why you would have done that, especially in this day and age when white supremacists seem to have an increasing hold in our society? I thought it would be important for for me and my peers Mm -hmm. to be able to go out into the world, to articulate differences of opinion. And, you know, at Williams College, students care about a number of issues, whether it's the environment, whether it's education, whether it's economic issues, inequality. If you want to succeed in achieving social change, you're inevitably going to have to encounter and talk to and work with Mm-hmm. people you deeply disagree with. And I saw college as a good place and an intellectual space in which you could develop the skills and the resources to do that. What would you say to people who would say, okay, well, that's kind of an interesting intellectual exercise, right. but yeah. do you really want to give a platform to people who hold dangerous views? I would say that whenever you're dealing with controversy, there are always costs and benefits. And I do not deny that it is certainly a cost that having a white supremacist on campus is going to offend many people, is gonna be challenging for many people, and in some ways is giving oxygen to those views. But I think that the benefits outweigh the costs in that now you have an opportunity intellectually to engage. You also have an opportunity for those who don't want to engage to think about ways of expressing dissent, whether it's through protest, whether it's through not attending the event, whether it's through writing an op-ed in the school paper, or voicing your disagreement in some other way. I think there's a certain skill set that you develop in simply thinking about how you're going to deal with that kind of event taking place. And when you started doing this on campus, you consider yourself, I think, a liberal Democrat, right? And you had many friends who would consider themselves also liberal Democrats or progressives uh, along those lines. And many of them really were not happy with what you were doing. Some were vilifying you. You were even physically threatened. And... I would love to know, kind of on an emotional level, Mm -hmm. how you dealt with those feelings, because I think those are some of the hardest feelings for human beings to bear, really, because we're such social animals. And the minute that happens, it's invoking feelings of ostracism and being banished from the tribe. So how did you feel and how did you deal? It was extremely difficult. I didn't show that or convey that publicly. Mm -hmm. And to a certain point, I didn't really even express the fact I was being interviewed about it or asked by a reporter, how difficult has this been? I would say it's tough, but I've managed. And I think the next event is going to be better than this one. Mm -hmm. But part of what I had to do was think about the figures, historical and contemporary, that I admire and look at how they handled extremely difficult situations. And one thing I noticed across the board was that when it came time for them to take a stand for something that they believed in, something that they valued, something that they saw as being important to the change they wanted to achieve. They were resilient, they were determined, they were persistent, and they didn't allow the emotions which are inevitable Mm -hmm. when it comes to dealing with sensitive issues to hold them back from doing what they felt they 
needed to do. So were you feeling the emotions and saying, I won't let them get in the way? Or are you able to compartmentalize so you don't have to feel them for the moment, at least, while you're dealing? That's a good question. It honestly is, it's some of both. Mm -hmm. It's a messy, complicated situation. On the one hand, my life has been challenging and complicated in a number of ways, and that has allowed me to compartmentalize. You know, having a difficult childhood at home Mm -hmm. meant that when I went to school, if I wanted to succeed and excel and be engaged and fully present in class, I could not let what happened the night before Mm -hmm. be the main thing in my mind. I had to find a way to put that out of, you you see what I mean? And so trying to figure out how to do that at a young age is very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with something so personal, years later, you're dealing with controversy and it's difficult, but you can say, I've done this before. And you think back and you say, okay, I was able to do it then, I can do it now. And you just resolve to say, I'm not going to let these negative emotions and negative feelings have the last word. I'm going to think about this as an opportunity for me to rise. Right. Okay. So you're saying when the difficult moments happen in your life now, you're actually consciously saying to yourself, I've done difficult things like this and worse. Far far more difficult, far more personal, Mm -hmm. intimate challenges, you know, with my mother, with family. And if I can handle that, Mm -hmm. and if I was able to overcome that, and get to this point, there's no way I can let this hold me back or stop me. Right, so you're sort of consciously emboldening yourself that way. Exactly, and then also looking at, you know, figures I admire, political figures, public figures, great leaders and activists, Mm -hmm. and saying, you know, they had to withstand controversy on a daily basis. I realize that there's never gonna be a scenario in which everyone is is happy with what you're doing, you know, and so you're gonna have to, to learn how to deal with those situations in which people are really upset. It's funny that you mention that, because I don't know if you saw this in the news, but there's a poem by Rudyard Kipling, uh, the poem, If, which I noticed you have as the opening to your book. And it's really a poem about self-mastery, and it's a poem about all the things you were just talking about. And apparently at Manchester University in the UK, that poem was emblazoned on, I think an artist had painted it on the wall of the Uh campus. Uh, And some student protesters had asked to take it down because apparently Rudyard Kipling had some pretty... Yeah, uh, yeah. Problematic views. Pretty problematic views, Kipling, who died in 1936, was one of Britain's best love writers. Some people call him the bard of empire. You probably know him as the author of The Jungle Book. He was an imperialist and, it's fair to say, a racist. He gave us beloved characters like Mowgli and Baloo, but he's also the guy who coined the phrase white man's burden and referred to people of color as half devil and half child. For years, scholars and readers have been debating his place in the literary canon. So I guess I'm curious to hear your take Take on a question like that. Like, what do you do with a work of art or a work of political thought or whatever it is that has value in and of itself, but the person who put it forth has some dangerous or problematic views? What's your thought? I think that, and you, we've seen this, this issue come up on a number of campuses across the country with monuments sometimes, sometimes mm-hmm. it's with art. Mm-hmm. I think there's a sense in which if you were going to remove it or take it down, it's almost as if you're trying to erase history. That's mm-hmm. one thing I think. At the same time, I think it's very important to note that there are great figures who've done great things who also had very problematic views, mm-hmm. right? Who also made very bad decisions. Right, who also did things that many of us would find immoral and we should acknowledge that. Because if we were to say that just because someone held slaves, we're not gonna honor them in any way or give them any recognition, I think it would be very difficult because our nation's capital is named after someone who at some point in their life mm-hmm. held slaves. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes this difficult terrain in which you say, are we really not gonna honor anyone who did something that was utterly detestable, mm-hmm. but also something that was done at that time by the majority of those who had power and influence. In my view, what's important is acknowledging these figures for who they really are. They are not perfect. They're not saviors, they're not saints. Yet they did accomplish significant things that have been critical for our democracy and society since their time. And so I think trying to address the complexities of who they were is really important. But I wouldn't say we should take the art down. I can imagine the response being, well, there's only so much wall space at the right, university. Right. And so why should we choose to give this very limited space 
to someone with this kind of background. And in fact, I think what ended up happening, I don't know the ins and outs of this particular story, but I think they ended up taking down the Kipling poem and putting up something by Maya Angelou instead. Right. So what, what do you think of I that? I would love to see something up by both of them. Mm-hmm. But in the case of taking Kipling down, you know, I think he was around long before I was. And so I only know what I've read about him in, in history books mm-hmm. and things of that sort. But I'm sure he was a complicated, you know, people are, are complicated. Human beings are naturally complicated. And so to say that because he had views that were held by many to be racist at the time, that in some sense would apply to so many people. I don't think that doesn't mean that we can't appreciate his, his art, his poetry. Mm-hmm. He's written about a number of things. And in the poem that I have in my book, you know, when he says to try to keep your head when all men doubt you, that poem has nothing to do with race. Right, right. You know, there are poems he's written that have nothing to do with the views that we really find deeply unsettling. And so I think it's, we shouldn't reduce who he was as an artist or a person to the most negative or problematic instances of his career. So far we've been talking about how to think about people on the other side of a divide, right. how to hold your own head, really, right. yeah. Um, yeah. when there are forces coming at yeah. you. What about the question of how do you reach the hearts and minds of people who disagree with you? And how do you have discussions with people across a divide that end up bringing them closer together instead of further polarizing them? And I think this is something, you know, it's, it's obviously happening at a grand political scale right. right now in our society, but it's also happening at all of our dinner tables. Yes. And so what should exactly. we do? I think we have to be attentive to the circumstances to the specific individual or individuals we're trying to reach. And we have to show them that this is about more than winning an argument or persuading someone. We have to show them that we are interested in humanity and helping humanity and understanding humanity. And I think the first step there is conveying an interest in their story, Mm -hmm. conveying an interest in how they develop the views that they hold, especially the ones we find very problematic. Because when you approach someone with a difficult issue or an issue you know Mm -hmm. that you disagree on if the first thing you're doing is let me tell you why you're wrong Mm -hmm. it makes people combative it makes people defensive all of the assumptions that they would readily make about you know i knew this is what you thought Mm -hmm. and i knew Mm -hmm. this is what you wanted you know what you wanted me to say or what you wanted me to think it kind of walls them off. Mm -hmm. But if you approach it and say, you know, I'm interested in knowing more about why you think X Mm -hmm. or what experiences in your life, what things that you've read led you to that point, then I think there's an opportunity there for you to to build an understanding of them and to build an understanding of how many people who hold similar views got to that point. But what happens when you listen hard, engage with compassion, and still can't see eye to eye? When you're here and they're there, when you're talking about big structural change and they're talking about a big, beautiful wall, this may be the greatest challenge to Wood's big idea, and we've all been there. You listen attentively, then talk until you're blue in the face, and still, the person you're debating doesn't budge an inch, and you don't either. Isn't there a point where tolerance turns to futility? Hi, I'm DC Marshall. Hi, I'm Mita Malik. We are the co host of the Brown Table Talk podcast, where we discuss how to help women of color thrive in their workplaces. And we invite allies to join us to help women of color win at work. We have a seat waiting for you. Subscribe to Brown Table Talk wherever you enjoy podcasts. If you have an opinion about what you're hearing today, we'd love to hear from you. Join me and many of the authors featured on this podcast at nextbigideaclub.com. So Zach Wood argues that open-mindedness is powerful on all sorts of levels. But can it also blind us in some ways? Susan Cain had an encounter that left her with more questions than answers about where to draw the line. I'll tell you about an experience I had. It was about a year ago, and a truck parked outside my family's house. 
and the the windows of the truck were full of Nazi stickers, and not just the swastikas, but the Nazi paramilitary symbols. And I was kind of looking at these symbols all day long. Right. And then at the end of the day, the guy who owned the truck came back, and I went outside. My husband had actually asked me to wait for him to come home, but he wasn't home yet. Okay. And there was the guy. So I went outside and I brought with me a photograph of many of my family members who were killed in the Holocaust. And I asked him why he wanted to drive around with a truck that would be so upsetting to so right. many people. Yeah. I didn't know who this guy was going to be. I, I was scared. I was physically scared when right. I went out. I actually asked a neighbor to, you know, just keep an eye out. Right, um, in case. Right, yeah. Just in case. But it turned out he was like, he was this very young, friendly, affable guy. Really? Yeah, yeah. And we ended up talking for a really long time. And I found it confusing on so many levels because he was sure. affable on the one hand and affiliated with a murderous ideology yeah, on the yeah, other hand. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the dangers sometimes or the, what can be confusing about right. the philosophy that you hold, which is it becomes sometimes difficult to distinguish in that moment. Right. Like, Who is who is affable and yeah yeah and and like I started yeah. out I went to talk to him thinking maybe there's a chance to change minds here right and I don't know if his mind was secretly changed but he didn't say it was by the end he and did. so you kind of walk away thinking well was that a good idea or not what was his you know? initial response when you showed him the pictures he said did he understand why you were yeah he it? did and okay. he basically said no offense against your family I'm sure they were nice people but I think it's I mean that kind of points precisely to one of the very difficult areas you reach yeah. when having these kinds of interactions. There's this natural tendency we have to like, oh, good person, bad person. Mm -hmm. I think it's like a kind of way of thinking. And the situation you're pointing to, here's this affable guy who talked to you for an extended period of time, yet who holds views that the overwhelming, I mean, you know what I mean? That are just absolutely and dangerous. horrendous and dangerous yeah. to yeah. society. Yeah. How do you make sense of that? Right. Is this someone who, with five more conversations like that, could potentially change their mind? I would say that I would never, with respect to something like that, say that I think everyone should have that conversation because I think people are different. I think it depends upon, you know, if, if you think that having that conversation is only going to make you feel more negative or feel more anxious or that you're not going to be able to gain something from it then you have to consider that. But I do think that we should generally try to be more open. And you can take things in degrees because mm -hmm. that's not just a sensitive issue, but someone with extremely, those are extreme views. Yeah. yeah. So maybe scaling it down. Yeah, by the way, I don't mean to equate first. all the people who you invited course, to campus yeah, no, no, with course, this guy. Yeah, yeah, totally, I think yeah, it's yeah, important yeah, to sure, say yeah, that course, because the stuff is... Right. Yeah. But, but I would say it's not that I ever think everyone should be able to, to do this and do it easily or do it effectively. Or that they're going to do it once and then they're going to say, I get it now. I can have difficult conversations anytime. But that if you try, if you make the effort once, twice, that there's potential to really gain something valuable there that you wouldn't be able to if you didn't make the initial step. Right. Okay, wait. I'm going to go to a less extreme situation, okay, yeah, which yeah, is, right, yeah. I know um, you were saying before we started that one great technique that you've come up with is to swap media diets with friends yes. who are on the opposite side right. of the political, right. the political spectrum. So right. can you talk a little bit more about that and what happened when you did that swap? Yes. So I was interested in trying to, to get a sense of, because we watch the news, we read newspapers. That's how we get our information. That's how we know what's going on in the world. I was interested in understanding how does that play into the formation and reinforcement of, of views, specifically views that I deeply disagree with. And so I was thinking to myself, what's like a feasible, practical way of like getting a better sense of that? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, who are the friends I have mm -hmm. that I know I don't see eye to eye with on many things? What if I were to, for the next week or two, just watch the news channels they watch, just read the newspapers and the magazines they read? If I did everything I could to make my news feed their news feed for mm -hmm. a week, just to get a sense, like what are the things that they're hearing, right? What's the message there? And it's really interesting. It's really fascinating when you do it because you're so used to, I mean, in some sense, that's the way social media works now. Mm -hmm. The algorithms right. kind of reinforce your own biases. And so I think, I mean, it's, for me, it was insightful doing it with mm -hmm. my friends. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great way to, to take that initial step of saying, 
I'm going to try to familiarize myself with someone else's position mm -hmm. and really the sources that inform yeah, that position. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it, it strikes me that the common thread in what you're saying is to really get to know who each person is, is. Um, right. from the inside out. Right. And I was struck even in your book, you opened the book by relating people asking you kind of what I asked you at the beginning, right. which was how did you have the wherewithal to withstand all these people criticizing you? Yeah. And your answer to that was basically, let me tell you the story of my life. And then you told it, exactly, you know, in a whole right, book. And, right, and you're exactly. saying the story, my, my life was so difficult growing up that it gave me the fortitude to withstand what was to come later. Exactly. So like, what is it about telling our personal stories that is so transformative? I think in one sense what you're doing is you're exploring your own journey and how you got to where you are. Mm -hmm. You're reflecting back on experiences that maybe you've thought about before, but not in as much of an organized way. You're going back to difficult, rough patches in your life and you're saying, how did I make it through yeah. these things? Because if now I'm in a position to write this and to share with the world, I made it through somehow. What were the factors? Mm -hmm. What were the difficult moments or the moments that gave you hope? And for me, writing Uncensored, it was all of that and more. Mm -hmm. And one thing I realized in writing it was that school for me became the main positive aspect of, of my life. Mm -hmm. Like the, mm -hmm. the most positive facet of my life was going to school and doing everything I could to excel there. Because at home, I never knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. And the majority mm -hmm. of the time, it was not good. And I had no way, you know, as a child, you're totally dependent on your parent. And so I'm living with a mother who has a mental illness, and that is extremely difficult. And so the only thing I really could look forward to on a regular basis was going to school, contributing in class, doing well, reading, things like that. And so your things that you should receive at home, mm -hmm. I had to find those things elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that was one thing I kind of learned about myself in the process. And I think it really explains the drive I have now to mm -hmm. continue building a deeper understanding of people to continue gaining knowledge and seeing that knowledge as something that will help me later in life. But there have been times in Wood's life when his thirst for knowledge proved downright dangerous. In his sophomore year of high school, Zach does something pretty typical for a teenager. He spends all of his money at once. What's not typical, though, is how he spends it. He doesn't blow his savings on clothes or video games. Instead, he empties his piggy bank so he can buy tickets to see his hero, the philosopher Cornell West. Zach is so excited at the prospect of seeing West in person that he decides to reread every book West ever wrote, all 20 of them. But there's not a lot of time in his schedule for reading. He leaves for school at 4 in the morning and doesn't get home until 9. Luckily, Zach knows just the right elixir to solve his problem. Red Bull. He begs his dad to bring home a few cans, which he proceeds to chug one after the other. Then he heads to his room, where West's oeuvre awaits. It's not exactly a reading haven. Through thin walls, he can hear the commotion of Ward 8, the poorest neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Tonight, as he reads, the words begin to blur. He's used to this. It's just exhaustion, he tells himself, and it can be cured by concentration. But then the room starts to spin. He falls from his chair and hits his head on the corner of his desk. His sister, startled by the noise, runs into the room. She finds her brother sprawled out and convulsing. She shouts his name, but he doesn't respond. He can't move. She yells for her father. Zach is still unresponsive. His father slings his son over his shoulder, carries him out to the car, and drives to the ER. When they get there, Zach is lucid enough to speak, but not enough to remember his name. He's going to have to stay a while. He asks his dad, can you go home and bring me back those books? And his dad says, no. Zach spends two days in the hospital. The diagnosis is extreme exhaustion and dehydration. After he gets out, he suffers through a groggy day at school. Then he heads to a deli to buy more Red Bull. Sure, it messed him up before, but he still has reading to do. That's when he gets a text from a friend with a simple question. Why do you feel like you have to read all those books? Zach usually has an answer for everything, but this time he's stumped. 
Is it because as a poor black kid at school, surrounded by children of senators and millionaires, he always feels like he has to prove something? Or is it the stern voice of his mother who would tell him that as a black man in America, he can only achieve respect through poise, intellect, and composure? The answer he finally comes to is pretty universal. Zach is tormented by the fear that he isn't good enough. And it was that fear that pushed him beyond what his body could handle. In his book, he argues that acknowledging our own vulnerabilities is a crucial first step toward understanding others. Only after embracing our flaws can we really reap the benefits of uncomfortable conversations. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from the leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. In learning to become honest with himself, Zach Wood discovered that vulnerability is a key to empathy, and empathy is the first step toward understanding. But no matter how honest and empathetic you are, he realized, you can't control other people. Often they barely listen to what you have to say before they make all sorts of assumptions about who you are and what you represent. That's especially true if you're a black man. Susan Cain wants to know, how can you approach others with open-mindedness if they aren't doing the same? You said, I always tried my best to show through my own actions that the things they believed about Black people weren't true. And I was really struck by that because that seems like a gigantic burden to carry into every it, social interaction. And even though it, it can make you a stronger person, it can build character in a sense, it can help you learn how to deal with a very uncomfortable situation, I would not hope or you know, wish that anyone else would have to deal with that. You know, in your history class, you may be the only black student. And so when you're talking about the Civil War and the issue of slavery comes up or an issue of race comes up, yeah. everyone kind of looks at you. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, and it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And what you say, it's not just Zach's opinion. Right. It, right? It's, right. It's implied that this is what, you know. Yeah, and so in that sense, a representative of, of millions. your race. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so constantly having that in the back of your mind and having to think, okay, I represent myself and I'm saying what I think. And you shouldn't just assume based upon what I say that this is what all African-Americans think mm -hmm, and feel. Mm -hmm. That can be tough to say in fourth grade. Have you developed any techniques for being able to just sort of relax and be you over time? Or how do you, how do you think about that now as an adult? As an adult, one yeah. thing is focusing on trying to distill for myself in my head what matters most to me in the moment. What am I really trying to achieve? I can focus on all these things. And yeah. you know, naturally, there are a number of things. There are certain things that are automatic now mm -hmm. that, you know, because my mom, she made me aware of them. And so it's kind of a forced attentiveness at yeah, first. Yeah. And then it just becomes a natural inclination almost. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've learned to do is just to distill for myself what matters most to me in this moment. What's the message I want to convey? What's the point I want to make? Or what do I want to learn? Or what do I want to gain? Mm -hmm. And if I can focus on that, then I know I'll be all right. Right. Because I have, there's a sense of personal clarity. So, okay, I mean, it's a really interesting decision to write as personal a memoir as you did. Uh -huh. And especially for somebody of the talents and the ambitions that you have, what is it like to lay all that out there? It was incredibly difficult to do. One of the most difficult things I've ever done. And in that sense, it's like a big learning experience. Yeah, I bet. And you're thinking, first it's on the page, and then it's in the hands of an editor, and then it's in the hands of whoever picks it up at the bookstore. Right. And, and having that in your mind, you know, that this is something I'm sharing publicly, I had to remind myself of what I was really trying to do. Which was what? Why did you do this? It's my belief, and this is a conviction that I have, that one of the best ways to really build empathy and compassion is through vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Through putting yourself out there and saying, 
it may look like I've got it all together, mm -hmm. or it may look like I am totally sure of this or mm -hmm. totally sure of that. But actually, these are a number of places and points in my life in which I've had all kinds of doubts, mm -hmm. in which I've made mistakes, in which I've learned things about myself, mm -hmm. in which I've become a stronger person. And those are the things, when I've read memoirs, that's really where I've learned the most. Things I can apply to my own life about that particular individual. And so that's what I was really going after mm -hmm. in writing something that was so deeply personal. There's one thing you talked about in the book that was such a big part of your life, and I'm not sure that all our listeners are as familiar with it as we all should be. And that is the burden that you felt to do code switching um, yes. when you were going to these schools growing up. So can you talk about what code switching is and yeah. what it felt like for you? So code switching is really when you modify your behavior, your demeanor, your attitude based upon the environment that you're in. Mm -hmm. And so when I am growing up in, in, a, in a rough area in Detroit yeah. and then going to school, in an affluent suburb mm -hmm. in Gross Point Farms. That's what the suburb right, was called. Right, Those which was like two totally different streets worlds. of mansions. Streets of mansions yeah. and manors. And we're talking homes of eight bedrooms, 10 bedrooms, basketball courts, tennis courts, things like that, pool houses. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I lived a block away from me, it was public housing. And so, how do you navigate moving on a daily basis such drastically different environments? One thing, and my mom actually played a big role here too, one thing you have to do, because we naturally all want to belong to mm -hmm. the communities we're a part of. Yeah. We want to fit in, we want to be liked, we want to do well, we want to succeed. That entails modifying your behavior, right? And in, in my neighborhood, I would say less. I would have to change my demeanor. I would have to change the way in which I interacted and approached people. Mm -hmm. In school, Why would you say less? Was talking too much? Well, there's a sense in which that could be taken as a sign of naivety or a sign mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. right? Another thing, too, is that I'm known as the kid who goes to the school that's not right. nearby. Yeah. But I go to yeah. the school in Gross Point. Yeah. You know, I've been seen reading. You know, things like this, mm -hmm. you already stand out. Right. You know, and there's, so there's less, in some sense, that you have in common. You're in the neighborhood. But I moved around a lot, so I'm often new to the neighborhood, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And maybe I have some different, the fact that I like to read and I like to write mm -hmm. and like to speak mm -hmm. and things like that. How does that, how do you then gel with the, the other kids in your neighborhood who don't have the same opportunities, who haven't had the same experiences and see you doing these things? There's a sense in which when you're in environments that are under-resourced, mm -hmm. communities that face crime and violence, the environments are contested and people tend to withdraw and they tend to say less mm -hmm. generally mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it, it's like a defense mechanism in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like you're better protected if you say less. The less you say, the, the less, less trouble you, you can The less get trouble in. you could possibly cause because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you don't know how someone's going to react to what you're right. saying. Right, right, right. People are dealing with a number of challenges from not having food on the table to losing their job Tension is often high. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's tension between the communities and the police. There's right, all these things right. going on. Sometimes it's just better to just say less. Right. And so you were getting up at four in the morning. Yeah. And around. then you were yeah. getting on to, I guess, sometimes the bus or the subway. The bus, and, train, and, and traveling. Two or three hours. hours. Yeah. And then yeah. suddenly you arrive at school and now you're supposed to talk a lot. Yep. Now and, I'm supposed to talk. Yep. And exactly. be very carefree. Right. Be, yeah, be carefree, be very yeah. engaged, to be on, honestly, to be on um, all the yeah. time uh, because I was a good student. And, you know, it's like once you do it once, you know, the expectation is there and there's a self-expectation as well. Being that school is the, the only consistent positive in my life. Right, right. Right. This thing, the one thing that I always looked forward to, the last thing I wanted was to ever have a day where I wasn't on, mm -hmm. where I didn't fulfill my own, you know, expectations for myself where as a student tutor, I didn't have the, the bandwidth to like be as attentive to the individual needs of the person I was working with, or I was stressed about something that was going on at home, and so I wasn't as engaged in class. Those were things that I tried to avoid whenever I could. What, so what did you do with the stresses? Because you, you had a lot of stresses, so where'd you put them? Some of it was, some of it was compartmentalizing, <laughs> mm -hmm. literally just tucking it away and saying, I'm not going to think gonna, about that I'm right going to walk in and just act like none of that exists. None mm -hmm. of that, whatever happened on the bus, Whatever's going on at home, none of it exists. 
I'm just going to focus on what we're doing in class, what the teacher said, what questions do I have during class, after class. You focus on being fully engaged there. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, it was also like an escape. So that made it that was like the, the enticement to, yes, to that was go the through all that work. That, exactly. Yeah. It's like it's an escape in a sense. Yeah. Because I really, yeah. I mean, I loved reading. I loved learning. And so in that sense, I could kind of throw myself into it and enjoy it at the same time. Yeah, I have to say, you know, I've always thought of myself as someone who really loves reading. Right. But yeah. like, it's like nothing compared to what <laughs> I would, I, you might be the most intellectually voracious person <laughs> I've ever come across. And I, like, I'm curious how you do that exactly. And right. how do you remember everything that you read? Part of it was this kind of curiosity uh -huh. that I had to, to understand one in this relates to the uncomfortable learning idea. How do brilliant, motivated people come to see the world in such different ways? That right. motivating question. It's that, that's the question that's, that's at like the heart the of everything you it do. It really right? is. How is yeah. it that people come to see things in such different ways in terms of what they think the government should do, in terms of what they think our society should be doing, in terms of what they think is right and wrong, good and bad? Like that question has always fascinated me. That's so interesting. And that's the question yeah. that we need to be asking and answering the right. most right exactly. now of all possible because questions. Because if you think about it, we really don't know. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, and it's different for different people. Right. So that kind of like motivated me to read about different issues and to see, well, what do people think here? For instance, if you take two sociologists mm -hmm. or psychologists or economists and you say they have access, each of them have access to resources and evidence and data and can conduct studies and do research mm -hmm. yet it's very likely that they don't think the exact same thing right how right. how does that happen right you right. know what is what are the the life aspects what are the circumstantial aspects thinking about that for me was kind of at the heart of everything that i've done when it comes to reading i want to kind of bring it back at the end to where we started which is the burning question that I think so many people have of what to do with their families at the dinner table, right. yeah, <laughs> where right. you know, yeah. people feel divided in ways right. they never have before. So can you kind of pull together some of the strands we've been talking about to give advice to those sure, people? Sure, sure. So one thing is maybe start those conversations on a lighter note. Uh -huh. Don't just dive head first into the, the political, moral issues that are at hand. Mm -hmm. And then to think about, especially if it's if it's family or friends, and these are people you know that you're comfortable with, to try to get a sense of what it is that motivates them and what it is that bothers them about whatever the issue is, whether the issue is taxes or immigration or who we have in office, whatever the issue may be, mm -hmm. to get a sense of what at the heart of it really, what's moving them, mm -hmm. right? what really bothers them. Because sometimes you've got the surface level understanding right, and people right. will say, this is unequal, this is why it bothers me. But sometimes there's something even deeper mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get a sense of what that is, begin with questions. What do you do with your own emotions while yeah. they're answering yeah. the questions and maybe saying things that, that are upsetting? I would say it's to try as best you can to communicate how you feel without showing it in a way that can kind of push the other person away from you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would kind of advise against raising your voice too much or cutting them off very often or just totally dismissing what they're saying. But say, actually, that makes me feel very X or Y. And here is why. To try to think about how to actually articulate, this is, this is why what you just said really concerns me. Mm -hmm. It's because I think that when people say things like that, this is what it can lead to. This is what it has led to in history. These are the, the negative consequences of such statements. And when someone who is in a position of influence says it, this is the chain reaction that we've seen. This is why it, it bothers me. Mm -hmm. So to like make that clear mm -hmm. without doing it in a way that's overbearing mm -hmm. or that can make the other person more combative. That's great advice. Well, Zach, thank you so much. It really has been fantastic to sit down and talk to you. No and I really hope everybody reads your book. Thank you. It's really good. Thank you so much. If you have thoughts about Uncensored or any of the other books in our series, we'd love you to join the conversation at nextbigideaclub.com. Podcast listeners get an additional 10% off with promo code PODCAST. Learn more at nextbigideaclub.com. 
If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes and a link to the next Big Idea Club. A special thanks today to Zachary Wood. His book, Uncensored, is available wherever books are sold. Thanks also to Susan Cain, who conducted the interview. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. This episode of The Next Big Idea was written by our associate producer, Caleb Bissinger. Sound design is by Jake Gorski. Our producers are Emma Cortland and Michael Kopnott. Our senior producer is Jonathan Miller. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. 